Hey, welcome back to the Awesome Life Podcast. I'm Karen Stelch, your hostess, and I want everyone to join me to welcome my awesome guest today. <laughs> uh, this podcast is designed for women in transition who are searching. What is the next step? What else can they do? How can they be inspired? So all of my guests are inspirational and we want to empower our listeners and inspire them to be all that they can be, which is being awesome in <laughs> all areas of their life. And it, admittedly, we don't always feel awesome. And that's why our guests can actually help us move forward to that strive for that, not perfection, but excellence. Mm. There is no such thing as perfection. It is excellent. And as long as we keep moving forward, as long as we enjoy life, we can't have anything except peace and joy and, and uh, freedom. And I think that's what we're all searching for. And I, I just, I love, I love, love, love my guests. And let me tell you a little bit about Angela Lee. We're going to be talking to her about her amazing life and how she got to this point. But a little bit of how she did get to this point. I, I'm upstaging you, Angela. <laughs> uh, Angela Lee has lived through so much adversity. And she said what didn't, didn't kill her made her stronger. And that is for sure, for certain. She has, well, you will learn all about her here. <laughs> she had an abusive alcoholic uh, father whose behavior had a major impact on her life. And as many of us, that behavior in her young mind created a rage in her and, and, but rage was an emotion that was something that was stomped down. You're not supposed to feel that way because this is what happens when you feel that way. And the judgment of anybody who became enraged, it just didn't serve her well. And yet there she was finding somebody else. Um, and then wildfires destroyed her home. You know, all of the wildfires out in California and that was the catalyst for some really significant change in her life. And over the last 12 months, she lost her home to fire. She left her marriage. She quit her job and she moved across the pond, so to speak. <laughs> and yeah. during that journey, she discovered so many tools of overcoming that adversity and achieving emotional balance. And now she shares these tools with our children through the mm. power of story. And because this is knowledge that they can make better choices. And to be quite honest, I need children's stories to understand life better. So Angela Lee, thank you so much for joining me today. You are absolutely amazing. Oh gosh, thank you, Karen. I am I'm am so honored to be here. And you know, it the the things that occurred in my life, yeah, they were hard. And when I was going through them, oh my gosh, I was totally in victim mode and um not really able to rise above the circumstances yeah. but once I got past them then I could start using the tools and and you know becoming more emotionally balanced and and now you're you're helping the kids because so many people that I communicate with have had those horrible childhoods of abusive parents and I, I, I love, 
and I've seen it in our own little school, our own little school of uh, 150 people, K through eight. And, mm -hmm. and I would say at least half of them come from homes that really have a challenge. And what those children ended up becoming or will become because they're just children. So to mm -hmm. have your, your stories, your story. So tell, tell me more about your stories. How, <laughs> yeah, I love um, stories. <laughs> uh, well, I do want to share a post I did on in Instagram last night. And it's this beautiful little girl dressed up as a fairy and w waving a magic wand. And, and the post picture says, all children are magical. Uh, yes. And then what I said was that <sighs> children are born with unconditional love. They learn from society, from religious leaders, sometimes from their parents, um, sometimes from other people. They learn to shield their heart. And when they shield their heart, they are closing themselves down to love and they're not able to love in the way they could before. And the last thing I said was, what would the world be like if every parent treated their child's heart as if it was the precious, infinite value jewel that it truly is? Oh, that's beautiful. And that's such a great question. Such a great question. Yeah. Because we People, always have a, a choice, but, but when we're children, we are not really empowered to follow through the choices that we might like to make. We, we come up. Right. We are, we're a little stuck in the circumstances as a child. Mm -hmm. And when I think about, you know, my father was a raging alcoholic mm -hmm. and he abused us in many ways. And one of the things that is stuck in my mind is my dad screaming at me and he's in an alcoholic rage. I'm maybe four years old mm -hmm. and he's telling me I'm not worth the dirt under his feet. When I'm four years old, he's the authority his word is truth. And so that becomes a truth about me that I carry with me for the rest of my life, unless I take a moment as an adult to revisit that scenario and to look at it from adult eyes. Because when we look at it from our adult eyes, we can see that what he said told the world a lot about who he was and said nothing about me. Right. Being able to, you know, many of us were talked to in that way as children. And when we can understand that we don't see the world as it is, we see it as we are. Mm -hmm. And the people around us see it as they are. And so when someone is criticizing, often what they're saying is about how they see the world. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the recipient of the criticism. But as children, they, we just don't have the, the knowledge or the, the strength inside of us to recognize that that is we don't have the tools to recognize we don't have the tools absolutely and um you know these these individuals are the authority figures and and we just take what they say as truth yeah you know so even even if i had the tools at four years old I wouldn't likely have been able to shift that perspective in that way. Right. I needed to be 
an adult enough to say no, you know, any father who's doing that to a child is no kind of father. <laughs> and um, it says everything about who he is in that moment. He's alcoholic. He's raging. He's not a good father. Yeah. And doesn't describe me in, in any way. <laughs> right. And as, as adults, a lot of the people listening in are women who, who may have had the same or similar uh, bringing up. And now yeah. they feel strong. Now they feel capable. And yet they're still uh, going into relationships with the same. Carrying that energy. Yeah. 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 And that's, it's really important to be able to shift the energy or perspective around what happened in your childhood to free you from the patterns of behavior that mm -hmm. take you into the relationship that mirrors that relationship <laughs> with your dad. And, um, you know, we, we can't fix our fathers or our mothers. We can't fix we can, anybody. <laughs> we can, well, yeah, we can fix how we view the situation. <laughs> we can control us, but that's it. Yeah. 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 So what did you do? Uh, in, you, you had the wildfires. You, you had a, a marriage. How long were you married? 30, almost 33 years. Oh my word. 33 years to someone who was, <sighs> he, he was severely emotionally injured as a child. Mm -hmm. He learned a set of tools that he used to deal with his emotions. And that set of tools was narcissistic behavior, mm. not in the grandiose narcissistic way where I'm better than you, but in a, what's called a victim narcissistic. Um, it's, it's like a profile of, of people who use narcissistic tools, but they see themselves or don't see themselves as a victim, um, but their energy is all about victimhood. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're not, they're not dealing with it. So, um, oftentimes, I don't know if this was the case for you, but oftentimes that type of person may, uh, try and make their partner feel less than who they really are. Mm, that was very much the case. And, and I don't think it would, you know, I will not say that he is a narcissist because I don't believe in labeling people. Mm -hmm. I know that the tool set he used was very much narcissism, narcissistic. And so there was controlling behavior. There was belittling behavior. There was gaslighting. And he doesn't believe he did any of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's part of the gaslighting because I'm like, no, I experienced it. It was there, you know? But, but you're, you're told in gaslighting, for those that don't know, it, it, it refers to a movie from the 50s, I think. I don't, I'm not quite sure. Something, uh, yeah. Where the husband uh, tried to convince that his wife that she was crazy, that she didn't know what was going on. And he had ulterior motives for that. Uh, and it was uh, called Gaslighting. Uh, the movie yeah. was called Gaslight. So now we refer to that kind of behavior of trying to convince somebody else that they're crazy that that isn't true that isn't true you know he he would say things in an argument and when i would comment later on on what he said in an argument he would tell me he never said that that it was in my imagination and that's just a small sample of the kind of gaslighting that I experienced. Mm -hmm. This is a man who is carrying deep emotional wounds 
And he just didn't know how to deal with them or how to treat people. And that's because of the way he was brought up. Mm -hmm. So what one of the things that I've figured out over the last couple of years Mm -hmm. is the generational aspect Mm -hmm. of emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. Because my father didn't innocently trip into alcoholism and rage. He was abused by his father. Mm -hmm. My understanding was opened up when my aunt said, Jimmy was such a sensitive child. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, that's my dad you're talking about. There's no sensitive bone in his body. (laughs) But He was born in the 20s, and it wasn't okay for boys to be sensitive. Right. So his father, and I don't know if he physically did this, but he emotionally tried to beat that out of his son. Mm -hmm. And he saw his son as um, just a failure. So my father began drinking to escape those feelings of not being accepted by your by his father of being seen as a failure by his father he was trying to escape his feelings but his choice of escape mechanism <laughs> wreaked havoc and caused tremendous pain for the people in his family And so it's like this generational, who knows how my grandfather was treated by his father. And I'm pretty much guaranteed. Now, mind you, disclaimer here, neither one of us, Angela and I are not doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists (laughs) of any kind. So this is not, this is just observation from a lay person who has lived it and has found the tools um, sometimes we're fortunate enough to find somebody who can help us recognize. Sometimes it comes to a climax where you just finally say, I can't deal with this anymore. Yeah. How did you find that strength to make such a shift? Ooh, um, it took the wildfire. So in California, our house you know, was destroyed in 10 minutes in, in a fire. Mm -hmm. And our, so there were neighborhoods in town that were completely leveled to the ground. There were on my street, there was probably 30 houses gone. Some, Mm -hmm. but maybe 10 somehow were missed by the fire. So Mm -hmm. it's a random thing, but (laughs) mine was one of the gone ones and um that it's like when when a wildfire happens in your community it's not like it's a one night thing it the fire continues for a week or so and so stores are closed and you can't go to work (laughs) and you really shouldn't be outside because the smoke is terrible and there's nowhere to go. Mm. You know, the, the hotels were 5,000 homes were destroyed in that fire. So the hotels are like, they're completely booked. Mm -hmm. Where do you go? And we ended up staying at, at my ex-husband's mother's house Um, but it's like the rug of your life is pulled out from under you. Mm. You get up the next morning and you're still in shock and you don't have a toothbrush. You don't have a bra. You don't have Mm -hmm. underwear. You're soft. And so 7 a.m. we show up at Walmart, which was the only store open with like there were maybe 20 other people in the store and we all had carts we all looked like zombies 
and our carts were filled with hairbrush, toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, you know, all the things we needed to, to start the day. And it's just, it's so disorienting <laughs> to have your life that upside down. It was, we were Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We were like bottom level survival. We needed to find a place to stay. And fortunately, we, we ended up finding a place to stay. Um, but that put me into a real dark night of the soul. Mm. Because I found myself at work. I have this whole life that I have to rebuild. But I'm sitting at work doing make work. And it was like, what the hell am I doing here? Um, there was no point to my work. There was no point to even buying things, even though I needed to buy things. I was just in this really strange state where I couldn't see the point to anything. Mm. And that caused me to ask some really bone deep questions like, is this the life that I want? Because if life can change that drastically in a moment, shouldn't I do everything to have the life I want? The epiphany shows up when the person is ready to hear it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So what made you decide to leave this country and go across mm. to another country? It, it was a great understanding of the kind of person I am. Um, there was that wildfire destroyed 5,000 homes and I left my marriage about six months later. I did not want to run into my ex-husband, not because he would do anything, but because I was afraid he could convince me to come back. Mm. And I knew that I would die inside if I went back because I was at that point <laughs> before I left. Yeah. And you didn't have the, the confidence and strength of your own ability to say, no, thank you. I, I had put his needs before mine for 32 years. Yeah. And yeah. six months later, I was not strong enough to not do that again. No, exactly. So um, you did what you needed to do to to find that strength yes so that you could come back to this country yeah yeah so I moved to England and it was very magical <laughs> oh tell us I love I love uh for those who are uh watching on YouTube you will see my Angela's beautiful hair but for those <laughs> listening to the podcast she has beautiful pink hair it's, it's, <laughs> not, it's not drastic pink. It's beautiful pink. And I asked her about it. And she said, well, it's one of the characters in my book of a, a young boy with, with this blonde pink, pink hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's beautiful. It's great. And so uh, tell me more. How did you get into the writing? How, what made you decide to start writing in England with the magical part? Yeah. The interesting thing is I had started writing the fairy tale for my friend's daughter, Isabella, um, before the fire. I was just, I was not um, trying to build a series of books. I was just writing a little story for a friend's daughter. And it got burned and the computer got burned. And so that story was lost. And at some point in my, because I had to learn to be alone. I had gone from my mother's house to living with my sister, to living with my husband, and then getting married. And so I 
I never, as a young adult, never lived alone. And it wasn't until I was 54 that I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? I'm alone now. Yeah, that's scary, isn't it? It is scary. And I think that a lot of women who are unhappy in their marriage are afraid Mm -hmm. of of going there because it, it's, It takes inner healing in order to to be comfortable with being by yourself. Mm -hmm. And I had to do it in order to learn that, you know? Yeah. 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 And and so you decided to rewrite this book for Isabella, the book that was destroyed, or how did the fairy tale? Yeah, I just I just had the feeling like, you know, that that was gonna be a good story. I should just start writing it. And maybe three or four months later, I had, I don't know, 50, 60,000 words. <laughs> oh my <laughs> so God. Clearly, this story needed to come out. Yeah. Um, we split it into two. So I have book one and book two. But the story doesn't end there because book three is in the illustration phase and should be released in. June, possibly. Um, Then book four will be released maybe by the end of the year. And I'm writing book five now. So so are these all kind of very different fairy tales with uh, with actual fairies? These are not just fairy tales. These are fairy fairy tales. (laughs) They are fairy fairy tales. And do they, have a um, they differ, or, or uh, yeah, they differ from the um, fairy tales of our youth, because the fairy tales of our youth showed the fae as tricksters mm-hmm. or evil that they would do bad things, and I think you know those fairy tales were written in a pretty dark time, uh, you know, (laughs) medieval in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, that, that influenced those times influenced the stories. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I know that I was paying in a past life. (laughs) So I, I know that the, fairies are actually emissaries of love. And so that is very clear in this series um, because love is really what... uh, One of the quotes from Queen Tatiana is that um, we are... It is our mission to be, do, and act in love. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. That just makes sense to me. (laughs) (laughs) It does. And it made sense to Jack Canfield, too, because he gave me an endorsement. When readers follow Bella Santini on her adventures, they learn that love is the answer, no matter what the question. Oh, I love that. Now, is is uh, that how exciting, Jack Candy? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. And um, so uh, Bella Santini, is that the heroine that goes through all of the books or just one she book? She is, yeah. Oh, um, so it, it's a little bit like the Harry Potter series in that the story picks up in the next book each time. And the same kind of cast of characters are are flowing through the story. Um, Bella Santini is the main character, and she's a human girl who is whisked away to the fairy land and goes through trials and tribulations, but eventually finds out who she really is. And that's kind of exciting <laughs> that's kind of kind of autobiographical <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> so uh i apologize here so 
let me ask you, um, it is, I totally agree. Uh, by the way, guys, um, when I interview all of our, our, our guests for the Awesome Life podcast, and Angela and I decided that we were soul sisters. <laughs> and we, we know that love is, is the key. And, and I know that our listeners are learning that if they don't already know it. But how, how do you show love to somebody who is a bully? Mm. And we have a lot of bullies in this world today. It's so, that is dealt with in the books. Um, so when I talk about my former husband, I have nothing but compassion for him. And I have nothing but unconditional love. I could not be in unconditional love when I was in the relationship because I had the condition that I be treated well. Mm. And so it just, what bullies need is unconditional love. They need to be accepted for who they are. And they need to be seen as the better version of themselves that they have inside. And that opens them up to becoming that better version of themselves. And is there, um, so by us showing love to someone who is being a bully towards so this is what, um, this is how the Fae explain it in the book. <laughs> when we see someone, let's say we see a bully picking on a, another kid, the Fae role is to send love to both sides. Okay. Yeah. Because both sides, you know, most, the human reaction is to send love to the victim. Or, or intervene with the victim. And um, it's explained in the book, but when I know from my experience that when I intervened for my children in our marriage, the intervention caused the anger to increase. Mm -hmm. And so it was worse when I would intervene. And I understand that, you know, if we see a parent abusing a child in a grocery store, of course we want to intervene. We want to say, hey, there's another way to do this. Um, but we run the risk of that child it being doubled down on that child when they get home. Yeah. And yeah. we don't see that and we can't help that. Right. So when we, when we energetically send love to both sides, they have the opportunity to choose love. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're sending the love energetically. And, and honestly, uh, we know, Angela and I both know, and, and perhaps our listeners do as well, that the energy, we are all energy and we can yeah. send that loving energy out. And it is like a ripple effect that affects the people around us. And it can go out, you know, 35 feet. So it's affecting people that you don't even realize. Yeah. And it makes a difference, doesn't it? That That's beautiful. So we are all also, um, you had brought up earlier in one of our conversations about, um, I like to say, what are the other possibilities? It, it changes a perspective of things if you look at it with a different, different eye. What? Yeah. What? What do you think about that? Would you tell our listeners about shifting perspectives? Shifting perspective is a skill that is just so valuable <laughs> in in life. If you want to live the best life you need to know how to shift your perspective. Yeah. 
because when we point our fingers and blame at anyone, we are making ourselves the victim. And when we are the victim, we have no opportunity to change the situation. And I've had people ask me, well, okay, but they did that. And they did that to me. And how can you say that I'm making myself the victim? We have the choice of how we respond to anything. If we can take the responsibility for our choice of response, we are lifting ourselves out of victimhood. We're saying, okay, they did that, I did this. And as soon as we say, I did this, we are no longer the victim. Mm -hmm. Now we are empowered to make choice. Mm -hmm. And that, that is the key. I mean, honestly, I, I know that I, I had been told that I was playing victim or I was taking too much responsibility for myself and for others <laughs> uh, on more than one occasion. But um, I, I thought, well, yeah, I'm not playing victim. I'm just taking responsibility for my actions. But then by shifting perspectives, mm -hmm. you could look, as you said, making the choice and and realizing that oh maybe i am playing the victim because i do get a lot of benefits by doing that there's that but also it's almost a learned thing mm -hmm. you know so if we were victimized by someone in our childhood then it's a pattern of behavior that it's easy for us to fall into mm -hmm. and it is by becoming self-aware that the perspective shift is important, but that self-awareness, because when we are reactive, that's revealing the energy that we are carrying that is reactive. Mm -hmm. So being aware of the fact that, oh, gosh, I was really reactive to that. How did I react? I reacted like they were killing me because they were yelling at me. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe that reaction was a little over the top. Maybe some of the energy came from something in my childhood mm -hmm. that matched the situation then you have the ability to go into your childhood, revisit the situation, see it through adult eyes. You can even pick up your inner child, <laughs> this little you that you're witnessing in that situation and give it all your love. Mm -hmm. And doing that kind of perspective shift is a really, really powerful way to move the energy out yeah. so that you're not stuck in that pattern anymore. It's, it is key. It is key. And as long as we refuse to look at that and say, well, I can't do anything about it. That is plain. I say plain. It's not it's not fun. It's not fun. It's not <laughs> no. fun. But it is being a victim. And we do as adults, perhaps not as children, where we've learned this, but as mm -hmm. adults, we can we can shift that. And with your books, your Bella Santini books, yeah, uh, are are so key to helping our children. There are a lot of parents out there who are trying to stop the contracts that were made. Isn't that, ages. yeah, and kudos to them. And because, yeah. you know, one of the things that I often say is, my parents, they didn't learn any of this stuff. They didn't learn how to manage their emotions. They didn't learn how to shift perspectives. They couldn't have t taught us. Yeah. And 
and their parents certainly didn't know any of it. And so I tell people to give themselves grace because this wasn't a priority teaching <laughs> by anybody in our lives. Even, you know, parents now, they're struggling to find ways to support their kids. And, you know, I, I hate to bring this up, but it is a reality. The suicide rate for children is going up. Yeah. And what I believe, what I, what I know is that if a parent reads these books to their child, the parent is going to learn emotional intelligence <laughs> as they're reading, the child is going to be engaged in the story and they're going to absorb the emotional intelligence. And it's like a parent doesn't, they're busy and they don't have time to go get a book on emotions in the bookstore, read it, and then teach their kid that. Right. But, oh my gosh. I wouldn't. A I, bedtime story? Perfect. How easy. Yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> and and that is the level that a lot of us, including myself, uh, can best learn from are the the Bella story Central. is such a wonderful way to That's learn. Short yeah. story. Short story. What can I do right now? I want to get I want to well the, the it is and, oh, well. <laughs> All righty. Well, 200 pages. <laughs> <laughs> but, but do learn, like, uh, as you say, the Harry Potter, this is the, a similar uh, thing. Uh, yeah, they're chapter books for right. middle, middle age, ki middle grade kids. And those kids are the ones that I, I saw in, in our little school here that really could have used that support because they're at that age, they yeah. are. Their hormones, their hormones yeah. are going and they're conditioned not to uh, trust adults per se. There's they don't no trust them go to and talk about their emotions or anything. They don't know how. Because... They don't know how. Their parents don't know how. Exactly. Exactly. And, and you know, <sighs> an emotion, the biochemistry of an emotion is maybe two minutes, max five minutes, unless our mind becomes engaged in the concept. And what I mean by mind engaged, our mind starts going, that's not fair. Or I don't wanna feel this way. Or, you know, the mind just starts grabbing on to <laughs> the whole idea of the emotion when we can be a witness and just, oh gosh, I'm feeling this way. And I teach it as feel the feeling, name the feeling, allow the feeling. And it's not allowing the circumstances, it's allowing yourself to feel how you feel, giving yourself permission to feel. Exactly. And that, that's the, the A in awesome. The A in awesome is awareness and allowing. Yeah. And it's all about being aware, naming it, mm -hmm. and then feeling it is allowing it. Because our words and our thoughts and our feelings are all energy. Yeah, exactly. Everything. And yeah. And when we resist a feeling the energy stays with us yeah and then it rears its little head at and it and it builds times <laughs> yeah and it builds and it builds and it builds and so you know that's why my dad had to drink as much as he did because the feeling kept growing as much as his alcohol <laughs> kept going mm. and and so there is no escape from our feelings we might as well just allow them and and, and i i will 
argue the point just a little bit. There is an escape from our feelings. It is to be aware of them, allow them, and, and <laughs> turn that fear feeling into a loving emotion. Embrace, embrace, embrace. And, and understand. Yeah. And when you can start responding to those emotions, then you can start um, acknowledging them and then your life changes. And sometimes yes. it takes, as you had to go through, uh, hopefully not have to go through as much as you did, but sometimes it comes to a point where you just say, I've had enough. Yeah. Everybody's different. Yeah. And, and they're going to, whatever their breaking point, hopefully it's not a wildfire. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's what I was trying to express. Yes. Yeah. But, but whatever their breaking point. It, and I need to, I am, I'm not going to take it anymore. And something has to shift. And I have to tell our listeners that sometimes you do not have to move across the pond, start no. writing books, change your entire life. And before that happens, sometimes it can be just enough of facing your fears and saying, I'm not going to take this anymore. And I'm standing up to this. It could be that. It could be a, as little as starting to value yourself. Uh, well, that's a huge thing, huge thing. Um, yeah, yeah. My clients have come to me to release a lot of the uh, the anger, the rage, the the issues that are going on, um, and replace it with the self acceptance and the and the self love. Yeah, and the tools that that we've discussed today, the perspective shifts, the um, being able to face your feelings are very important tools, but self-love is, to me, the number one thing. It's key. It's, it's key. If you can't love it's, yourself, yeah. it is. Yeah. It's and I, that's why I was in that marriage for 32 years. I didn't value myself enough mm -hmm. to choose myself over someone else. Yeah. Yeah. The, the unknown is the scary place to go, even if it's a better place. It's still yeah. unknown and it's scary. Mm. Yeah. 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 So, well, Angela, thank you so, so, so much for, for joining us today. And um, how, how can people reach you? How can people reach out to you, find you, find your books? Yeah. So my books are on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, they're, they're not yet popular enough to be in the, in the stores, but I'm hoping soon, um, because really I'm on a mission and the mission is to empower children to love themselves and be able to deal with their feelings so that they do not choose suicide as a way of escaping their feelings. And so, um, you know, that's why I do all, as many podcasts as I can to just get the word out. Um, and may I make a suggestion to our listeners who are out there is to get the Bella Santini book. Go to, uh, you, you have a website. Amazon. Or, pardon? Do you have a website as well or just? I do. My, my website is www.angelalee.com. Angela and so what I would love is to have everybody buy those books because Angela is so insightful and yet able to put it into terms that with such love to give to the children and the parents and we all need it. We do. Uh, every single one of us needs it. And I would put out a, a request to any of the parents to get the book, even if you don't have school age children, get the book and donate it to your school library. Mm -hmm. 
I think every school library should have something like Angela's books. Just Thank so you. that students can say, all right, well, I'm not gonna tell anybody, but I need this. Yeah. You know, I, I doubt a 17 year old will pick up my books. Mm -hmm. And my older will. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I, um, there are kids as young as six who are trying to read my books. They may need their parents' help, though. Um, the, the thing is, this is why I write them for the ages I do, to get them before they have reached the pit of despair, to get them before they are so disconnected from who they are that that they're making crazy choices um, to, to give them the tools so that they can avoid those things. I love that. And just as a real quick end from our beginning with your beautiful pink hair and the boy, Barry, with the pink hair, we decided that he was very confident in himself. <laughs> he had a lot of self-love because he was not going to be pushed around by anybody um, told that he was um, anything less than who he is. I love that. Well, Angela, thank you so, so much for joining us today. And um, any last word? Yeah. Mm. So just... <laughs> Readers, give yourself grace because you weren't taught this and you can start now. It's never too late. It's never too late. And when you look in the mirror, try to catalog what you like rather than seeing what you don't like. Oh, what a and great that's, exercise. That's a wonderful exercise to build self-esteem, self-love. Exactly. That's a beautiful exercise. Just baby steps. It doesn't take a lot. No. Just the little things and, and finding the support in your, your friends or family or, or Angela or, or myself to help you recognize how amazing, amazing you are. Angela is amazing and I love her and all of the details and all of the links will be in the show notes below. Uh, and come on over to YouTube and be sure to subscribe and like to uh, Awesome Life Conversations. I know I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you again for, for joining us today. And everybody have an awesome life. Mm. And the 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 A in awesome is for awareness and allowing. And the final E in awesome is for enjoyment and fun. Mm -hmm. Every moment of every day, find that enjoyment and fun and be aware of how awesome it is. So thank you for joining us. And until next time, have an awesome life.